feels like a lot of folks in Bronzeville aren't just running their businesses, but they're really thinking about a bigger ecosystem. History repeats itself, right? And I think that's what's going on in Bronzeville today. Bronzeville finds its origins as the black metropolis because it was left out of Chicago's ecosystem. So Chicago's going through this big boom through the 1920s and none of it's reaching Bronzeville. And so they have to create a city within a city. Bronzeville, it was this really explosion, this evolution of culture that developed into new and exciting forms of expression. So it became really the focal point for black culture and the crucible in which forms of art were created. I always think of Bronzeville kind of like a diamond. I know that a lot of the stories that are, are told about Bronzeville always talk about how densely it was populated. And I think it's because of that density that so much creativity was just literally oozing out. It's almost like it's a neighborhood, but also an artist colony. Oh yeah, for sure. That's a great way to put Bronzeville. Bronzeville gives us gospel music, right? With Mahalia Jackson and Thomas Dorsey. Then, you know, we, we love talking about rock and roll, but the godmother of rock and roll is Sister Rosetta Tharp. She inspired Elton John, Little Richard, Elvis, and she lived in Bronzeville. This explosion in art and culture also led to a proliferation of public queer life. One of the few openly lesbian performers of the era, Ma Rainey, recorded some of her early blues records in Bronzeville. Black business owners even sponsored female impersonator shows like the annual Finney's Ball that began in 1935, a precursor to the ballroom scene that led to today's drag shows. This same cultural liberation allowed the black middle class to thrive, with many forms of commerce emerging out of this black metropolis. Bronzeville was in many ways truly a promised land. The black metropolis included what people call Black Wall Street, the finance industry, but at the heart of the black metropolis is the jobs and the commercial enterprises that were created to serve the community. The playing field here, because of being boxed out of the economy of Chicago, allowed for folks in Bronzeville to circulate their own dollar, and that circulation really flourished. That self-reliance also then leads to the creation of nationally significant organizations, nationally significant publications that, that really change the course of American history. Yeah, right, you can't truly activate whether it's civil rights, whether it's the arts, without like the media, right? Uh, Robert Abbott and then uh, John Sinstack from the Chicago Defender would refer to themselves as the mouthpiece for 14 million African Americans in this country, with two thirds of the readers not even being from Chicago. Of course, media mogul John H. Johnson's from Bronzeville, right? He created Ebony and Jet magazine. And you know, the first ever black feature filmmaker and the first black on-air radio personality here in Bronzeville. It was really, really pivotal to, to have that space to be able to kind of push back from the narratives that were uh, often portrayed in the national media. It seems like there's a lot of history in Bronzeville that maybe a lot of us don't know about. It's vast, right? We'd be here for an hour talking about all that Bronzeville has given the country. One of the main things is that, you know, education is that great equalizer. The University of Chicago was early to allow African Americans to get advanced degrees, master's degrees, PhDs. It was close to Bronzeville, and when you're really close to others who are doing amazing things, it'll help you do amazing things. Bronzeville hosted Providence Hospital, which was one of the first teaching hospitals that accepted black trainees in the United States. And Daniel Hale Williams, one of the leaders of Providence Hospital, pioneered the first open heart surgery in Bronzeville. Bessie Coleman, who lived right here, was unable to get trained in the U.S., but was sponsored by the Chicago Defender to get training in, in France and became one of the first black aviators in the country. I mean, these are super significant players in how black history has progressed over the last century. And not just those organizations, but like the recording of black history, right? Black History Month as a concept. It comes from Bronzeville. So for most of its early years, this community was referred to as the Black Belt. Folks considered the Black Belt not to be the great part of Chicago that it is. And so Bronzeville was a name given to celebrate what this area was. 
It's bronze, mahogany, cultured, it's rich. The name of Bronzeville articulates our definition of this community as the promised land. So walking through Brownsville now, there's, there's so much culture, there's obviously history that you can feel, but it's not, it's not necessarily that community that it was in the 20s and 30s. So after a very famous Supreme Court case, the restrictive racial covenants in and African Americans are able to move to other spaces. I don't want to paint the picture that they abandoned Bronzeville, but just Bronzeville was very, very overcrowded. There was about 300,000 folks living here and there was room for about 150,000 of those folks. Just for the necessity of space, they start to move to other neighborhoods. When the affluent African-Americans move away, they start to knock down black homes and businesses. We've lost literally dozens of iconic spaces from the Regal to the Savoy and on. And when we lose those spaces, we lose a connection to that era in our history. The Forum is the only major space that remains intact today. So that's why we want to rehabilitate this space, because it gives us this very unique bridge, both to that history and to what's possible going forward. So what does the path forward look like? The answer is complicated, but there may be clues in 100-year-old backdrops found in the attic of Forum Hall during its rehabilitation. This is a reproduction of backdrops that we found in this attic. When you look closely, you see that there are several figures in the backdrop, but the three that are at the center are three black people. And not just black people at the boundary, at the border of it, it's black people at the center and pointing to the future. It foreshadows what was to happen in this community. Black metropolis really drove this culture. Those things gave us a, a platform in developing the path forward. Backdrops painted before the Great Migration, before Brownsville was Brownsville, illustrate the same enduring vision that many residents have adopted today, placing Black people and culture at the center of Bronzeville's identity and evolution. That energy and vision is absolutely uh, drawing people back. And Bronzeville today is experiencing a wonderful resurgence, a, a revitalization, a period of investment and growth you're beginning to see new models of commerce and of social activity emerge. Blacks of all types are thinking about Bronzeville as still the center of Black Chicago and the soul of Chicago. We're revitalizing the institutions that have been here for many years. We are building new properties. We are creating wonderful new institutions. There's a Ghanaian term that's entitled Sankofa. It means to go back and get it before you go forward. And so I believe a lot of people here are going back to reclaim our stories. We're going back to reclaim the narrative of Bronzeville. You know, you have to invest in where you believe, and, and that's why I'm still here. There's a vision of Bronzeville that's emerging of a community that once again is fully employed a community that is tremendously vibrant culturally, where on any given night of the week, you can go and see a, a, a wonderful dance performance, where you can go and, and hear blues, jazz, R&B, hip hop, in a number of clubs around the community. We can build a new metropolis. That's the vision that we're working to create.